Well, I guess primarily I think it's lots of fun. Um, and that may sound trivial, but it's a very, I think, profound kind of fun. Uh, coming to understand things. I think there are aesthetic values. If there are any such things as aesthetic values, there are lots of aesthetic values in philosophy and in the kind of various construction that philosophers, uh, I think, do. Coming to see a new and especially perspicuous way of understanding things that seemed like just a jumble or an incoherent batch of stuff before. I guess that can be fun in the way that listening to music can be fun and fulfilling and so forth. Welcome everyone to today's interview, where I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Kendall Walton. He is Emeritus Charles Stevenson Collegiate Professor of Philosophy and, and Professor of Art and Design at the University of Michigan. His work has focused on philosophy of art, as well as other issues in the philosophy of mind, metaphysics, uh, and language. His books include um, Mimesis as Make-Believe on the Foundations of the, Represent the Representational Arts, uh, Marvelous Images on Values in the Arts, Listening, Looking, and Imagining, Essays and Aesthetics, and uh, In Other Shoes, Music, Metaphor, Empathy, and uh, Existence. He also has a variety of published articles on these topics and more, but uh, feel free to add anything. But with that, welcome in, and thanks so much for being here, Professor Walton. Thanks very much, Troy. Glad to be here. Awesome. So I, I did I did want to start with some, uh, some questions concerning fiction, um, which is really interesting topic. I actually recently had um, a guest who came on to talk about this, um, Manuel Garcia Carpintero, and, and had a great uh, interview there. And um, on, on your on your earlier account um, uh, of, of fiction, uh, of fictionality, a proposition is fictional uh, in the world of a particular work, uh, W, just in case the appreciators of that work are to imagine it. Uh, just in case the full appreciation of that work W requires imagining it. Um, now you've you've since found this to be a not fully adequate account. You know, since uh, while it might be a necessary condition, this uh, condition it's not a sufficient one. Um, so, for example, fictions can themselves include fictions or things that are not true, and we can imagine those contents, even though the contents of those kind of secondary fictions are not fictional in the world of the primary fiction. Um, maybe this is a bit confusing way to state it for the audience, but have I stated this more or less right, or how would you characterize that? Yes, I, I think you got it right, and I'll elaborate a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I think maybe it's important to know first that uh, the notion of fictionality is uh, that I'm using uh, is the notion of something's being true in a fiction, in uh, colloquial terms. And uh, I think that is uh, really about the most important fundamental uh, notion to think about in talking about fiction. Uh, some writers want to start with the notion of fictional works, works of fiction as opposed to works of nonfiction. Uh, but that is rather different and I think that is uh, not nearly as important, it's not nearly as crucial in our actual activities that we engage in with uh, novels and stories and pictures and so forth, as is the uh, notion of truth in fiction or what I call fictionality or fictional in a work world or fictional in a world, fictional in a fiction. Uh, uh, one indication of this may be that uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, the notion of uh, fictional works and works of nonfiction, that distinction uh, often doesn't come up and it doesn't have to come up in lots of cases. For instance, it's sometimes argued whether In Cold Blood is a work of fiction or, or not. And uh, 
one possible response to that is just to say, well, gosh, it doesn't really matter how we classify it. Let's look at it. Let's look at the work and see what it does and see how it does it and so forth and not really worry. But when we're concerned with a work of fiction, let's say, which has a fictional world, uh, we can't really say that about whether a proposition is fictional in the work or not. Sometimes we might not be sure, but it matters. And that's one of the first things, one of the main things usually that we are interested in, in cases of fiction. So, uh, <clears throat> yes, and as you say, my initial account of fictionality is something, uh, a proposition is fictional in a given work just in case it is to be imagined. This is a normative notion. It's to be imagined insofar as you are appreciating that particular work. Uh, and uh, uh, let me add a little bit uh, about the notion of fictionality. Uh, there is uh, There are different fictional worlds, different fictional uh, works of fiction and other things which are not works of fiction, but nevertheless have have uh, uh, fictional worlds. Uh, obvious case from my writings, of course, is that of children's games, but there are lots of others as well. Pictures have their own, I call them fictional worlds, if you like, call them picture worlds, but we still have to think about what is true in the picture, what is true in the picture world or fictional world and what is not. And of course, there will be what is true in a uh, children's game of make-believe, playing when they're playing dolls or if they're playing cops and robbers and so forth. And there will be differences. There will be some things will be true in it and some people, same things will not. <clears throat> but uh, for um, background, sorry, I'm talking a long time, not, ask, not letting you ask questions, but let me just make one more point or a, a couple of them. Uh, Fictional, fictional truths come in clusters uh, connected with different fictional worlds. And I need to uh, emphasize now more than I did in some of my writings that uh, fictional worlds uh, can be very local and can be very temporary uh, and still have the basic structure of within a certain social context, maybe a local and temporary one. Uh, certain propositions are to be imagined and certain others are not. An example I like to use is, and this will be about the last thing, I'll let you ask more questions. Uh, uh, if a couple of kids or a couple of adults are lying in a meadow looking at the sky <clears throat> and they see some clouds, uh, one of them might say, hey, look at that bear over there. And uh, another one might say, Oh, that's not a bear. It's a it's an elephant. Can't you see the trunk? And uh, there they have adopted, uh, not explicitly but implicitly, um, a norm that one is to imagine whatever it is that, from that point of view, in that on that occasion, the cloud looks like. And because one is saying the other one is wrong in this very local and very temporary context. So uh, I want to emphasize that uh, fictional work, not fictional works, there's no fictional work here, no work, no work of art, no work of fiction involved in this case, but there is a fictional world and there are prescriptions to imagine certain things in this very local social context and not to imagine others. Uh, so. I need. I want to emphasize that their uh, fictional worlds can be fleeting, and they can be temporary, and there can be lots of different ones, and they can change, and so forth. But they still have the same structure of there being mandates or prescriptions to imagine. Okay. Uh, do you want to add? Uh, that was kind of a lecture to begin with. No, no, that's that's great. Um, it helps to. Um clarify some of your views here um one other thing you mentioned one of the things you mentioned kind of early on concerned well how are we separating works of fiction from say works of nonfiction? and i mean you think it's right to say that yeah there's probably pretty kind of 
vague boundary there. I mean, you can have some things that are sort of fictions, but they can include some true elements and things that are more or less nonfiction, but they include some fictional elements. And maybe there's no sharp boundary between what exactly is a, a fiction and what's nonfictional. Um, yeah, is that, that, that is certainly true. And in cold blood might be one thing that's sort of on the boundary. But um, there are, of course, also vague or uncertain cases of what is what propositions are true in a fiction. Uh, is it true in a fiction that so-and-so is gay or is not gay? Well, people argue about that, and maybe there's no right answer and so forth. But uh, what I'm more concerned about is the fact that it matters uh, which is which, even if you can't quite decide in the case of propositions that are fictional or not fictional. And it often does not matter whether a work is a work of fiction, counts as a work of fiction or not. And in fact, there may be various cultures which don't even recognize that distinction. I don't know if the Greeks do. I don't know if all other cultures have uh, categories of fiction and nonfiction. They just have lots of works, uh, literary works or other works, which uh, might uh, we might describe as fiction or not fiction, but uh, they may not care that much or may not know, although they will care about lots of other things like whether the works, the sentences in the work are true, uh, whether they're asserted, whether they're believed, whether they're expected to be true, and so forth and so on. And that they can think about even without deciding anything about what counts as being a work of fiction or not. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, that, that seems fair. I mean, I'll be, we can still ask all these questions um, or consider these, these points that you're raising independent of, well, is it really fit? What are these categories here on works of fiction and, and not, you know, um, I did want to ask also though, that, um, as you said, you know, fictionality here is you're, you're talking about truth and fiction essentially. And I was wondering how similar or compatible with your, your view is to maybe some sort of pretense theory, um, where, um, well, we're, we're talking about, um, when someone makes a fiction or is asserting some fiction, they're, you know, they're really doing a sort of make-believe. They're, they're pretending as if this is the case or pretending um, they're saying things as if they're asserting something, but they're not really doing so or something like that. Um, yeah. Is it sort of similar to that? Is that compatible with what your view is here or is it something? Well, I, I'm uh, certainly amenable to speaking of pretense in these cases. Uh, I use the notion of imagination uh, rather than pretense. I mean, if you want to say that uh, uh, we pretend that Anna Karenina threw herself under a train, for instance, uh, maybe that's okay. I prefer to say you imagine uh, that. Uh, but the difference may be that uh, to say you're pretending suggests that you're performing some action as though something is true. And in fact, you might think of pretense, pretending often as doing something and imagining it to be doing something else. Uh, but there are cases where you're not doing much. You're just looking at a picture and you see that somebody is smiling. You're not doing much, but you're imagining the person smiling. So uh, imagining is a bit broader than, than pretense if you take uh, seriously the suggestion that pretense involves some kind of explicit action. So, but otherwise, I think that I'm perfectly fine with using the word pretense. Right. And then, you, you, of course, imagining, you say it's a bit broader, but uh, um, is there a way to think about what that involves more precisely? Like, I mean, obviously, there's certain mental activities that we would count as imagining. Like, I can visualize something, I suppose. I can, yeah, I don't know. Like, is there a sort of general account of, of imagining here? Because it can be a bit yeah. Ridiculous. It seems to me. Well, as lots of people have pointed out uh, in uh, my, what my uh, my Mises is make believe, I said that it'd be nice if we had a general account of imagining, but I don't have one. Uh, so I think that's something that needs to be done. Uh, it certainly do, it certainly doesn't have to be imagining in my sense. Certainly doesn't have to be visualizing. It might very very well involve visualizing, but it doesn't have to be that. Uh, 
And uh, I'm especially interested in what we might call imagining seeing or imagining hearing about things and so forth. But the notion of fictionality that I'm concerned with, I define in terms of propositional imagining, as imagining that something is the case. And uh, 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 I take that to be stronger than just supposing that something is the case, but what exactly the difference is, I'm not exactly prepared to say. And uh, so I think this is a, a promissory note that I hope somebody will help me figure out uh, answer to some time. Uh, it's a place, uh, uh, a place saver uh, for a notion that I think we need in order to understand what uh, fictionality is. Right, and I, I, we're not so clueless on on it that we can't use it for this sort of theorizing. It's, it's sort of enough there, but a fuller account would, uh, well, yeah, maybe it's forthcoming right. or someone else, yeah. There, yeah, there are lots of cases in which it's clear that somebody is or is not imagining something and the proposition is or is not fictional, even before we're able to give a full account of what that amounts to. So, well, you could, maybe you want to follow this up a little bit, but we can talk about the changes, uh, objections I have to my original account of uh, fictionality. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, I have more lately discovered, I think, cases in which uh, uh, certain imaginings, propositional imaginings are mandated, are prescribed, but the propositions are not true in the relevant work, not fictional in the relevant work. So maybe it'd be helpful to have a few examples. Uh, one example I use, uh, well, uh, a class of examples are ones that where we have what we call meta representations, representations of representations. Uh, one example is for me, I guess the title that I have is "Woman Standing in a Virginal," and uh, that's a picture in which it's fictional that a woman is standing in a virginal, so forth. Uh, but there is also in the background of the virginal a uh, a picture, a framed picture on the wall, and that's a picture of Cupid. Uh, so it's also fictional in the painting uh, that there is a, a picture of Cupid, a framed picture of Cupid. But we also, in order to know what that framed picture is a picture of, we also have to imagine Cupid. We have to imagine seeing Cupid. And I think that involves imagining that uh, a boy with arrows, uh, uh, with a bow and arrows exists. Uh, we have to imagine seeing that in order to figure out what is true in the picture, in the internal picture uh, that is uh, in, the, in Vermeer's work. And that's something we have to do, we are mandated into, to fully appreciate Vermeer's painting uh, we have to imagine not only the picture of Cupid, but we also have to imagine Cupid. But it is not fictional in Vermeer's painting that Cupid exists. It's fictional only that a, that a picture of Cupid exists. Uh, so that's one case. We've got to separate that out, uh, figure out some way of understanding why um, that uh, doesn't count as being fictional in Vermeer's painting. Uh, but it is, uh, even though it's ma mandated. And here is where the notion of different clusters or different fictional worlds comes into play. I think we'll want to say that there is one fictional world which consists of the propositions that are fictional in Vermeer's painting, and another one uh, which is maybe larger, uh, which includes the proposition that uh, there is that Cupid exists, and those are linked, of course, because we have to understand we have to appreciate one in order to understand what's going on in the other. Uh, and of course, there are also other cases. There's a, a picture of a doll, where we should imagine need to imagine also a baby, as well as a doll, 
and there's stories within stories and uh, movies about movies and so forth and so on. Lots of cases like that. Those are not the only kinds of cases that are problematic for my original account, but there's some of them. Right. Yeah. Um, and broadly, I guess the, what's kind of um, true of all these examples is that there's something that's a part of the fiction, which is itself a sort of, well, um, it's a sort of fiction or uh, itself where yeah. understanding it or imagining it as such requires, you know, imagining something that's not true, even at the fictional world. If that's yeah. What sense. Let's say, let's not say that it's an, another work of fiction, uh, because maybe it's not, but there's another fictional world. Okay. Uh, maybe a temporary one, in this case, not too temporary, because I think we need to con uh, continue imagining Cupid, imagining seeing Cupid uh, as we contemplate Vermeer's painting. But it's a different, it's a different cluster of fictional truths uh, than different from the one that constitutes what's fictional in Vermeer's painting. The one that we have to engage with. We have to engage with both of them. Right. But then the 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 second one is not actually something true at the fictional yeah, well, at the original fictional world. <laughs> right. It's true. Right. It's a kind of secondary world. Right. Um, right. But that's a fair distinction to talk about worlds rather than fictions. So so we might think about some other examples too. Uh an obvious one is a mystery story, uh or a murder mystery in which the author uh, gets us to suspect the butler uh, as the murderer in the first half, but then, lo and behold, we discover that it's not the butler, it's the gardener that did the dirty deed. And so what's true in the, sto in the story as a whole is that the gardener is guilty, but uh, nevertheless, to fully appreciate the work, we probably have to initially imagine that the butler did it. Uh, so there's a prescription to imagine uh, something which turns out not to be true in the story. That's a relatively easy case because we can say, well, what's fictional is what we are to imagine after all said and done, after we read the whole thing. And uh, maybe there's a temporary fiction that we engage with in the first half of the work, but that's different from the, uh, uh, fic the fictional world of the work as a whole. So but we can't uh, say that sort of thing about the Vermeer case because it's not that first we uh, uh, do, uh, ima are to imagine one thing and then later on know we're to imagine something different. We continue imagining Cupid, I think, throughout the time that we're watching that we're looking at Vermeer's painting. Right. And so, um, how, how would you characterize your, your um, like updated view, or, or how would you re to attempt to resolve these these problems now? Well, I I don't have a good general way to resolve them. Uh, as of, I mean, some people have suggested some, but I haven't found any of them especially convincing for all of the cases. Maybe for some of the cases, uh, the mystery case I think is relatively easy. Uh, but the others are not. Uh, so for now, uh, again, there's something I'd like some help on. Uh, but what I do want to say is that we have to distinguish between different clusters uh, of fictional truths. And uh, one thing to notice here actually is that although we are to imagine Cupid and we're to imagine a picture of Cupid, uh, and to well, we're to imagine Cupid and to imagine that Cupid does not exist, I think. Uh, probably background information makes it reasonable to say that in the world of the Rear's painting, there isn't really any Cupid. There's only a picture of Cupid. So <clears throat> we are to imagine both that Cupid exists and also that Cupid does not exist. And... Uh, but what's pretty clear is that we're not to imagine the conjunction of those. It's, uh, we're not to imagine that Cupid does and does not exist. So, and that's a clue that we're dealing with different clusters, different fictional worlds here. 
And I think that sort of thing is going to be generally true in most of the cases that, that we're talking about. So we got to recognize different clusters and how exactly we specify what the clusters are, I think, is our things that need to be worked on. Yeah, um, that's good. Um, could there be some way to go where we try to, um, we, we say that was true at the fiction, you know, you have these, these different worlds, say, and in some sense, there's like the broadest one or the most basic one, and then maybe there's other ones. And we can talk about what's true in the fiction being what's true at this at the broadest world, but then maybe you could fill in what it means to be the broadest world and so on. But I don't know, do you see where I'm coming from? But maybe there's yeah. a way to go there. Or, yeah. uh, I'm not sure that uh, the, the difference will be in breadth if that's a matter of uh, how many fictional truths are, how many propositions are fictionally true or fictional in the different worlds. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, it may be good to keep in mind <clears throat> here my distinction between a work world and a game world. Uh, when you're uh, looking at a painting, there one fictional world consists of what's true in the picture, in the world of the picture. But you're also, the viewer is also playing a game. I call it a game of make-believe uh, with that world. With that, with the picture, and in that world, I am seeing uh, a person playing an instrument. For instance, uh, I'm seeing I'm. Uh, it's fictional that I am looking at uh, a picture of Cupid, and so forth. And there will be lots of other fictional truths, maybe about what I think or feel about those items, uh, depending on. Uh, in some sense, what I'm actually thinking and feeling and doing as I look at the picture. I might, it may be fictional that I'm staring at the picture, staring at the frame of the picture, or that I don't notice the strip that frame of the picture, and so on. And uh, uh, so there might be, there are likely to be lots more fictional truths in my game world than there are in the world of the picture. Uh, on the other hand, we might say that the world of the picture is more basic uh, in some sense. I don't know exactly what the sense would be, but that's the focus of interest, probably. Uh, maybe not. Maybe I may be also in my reaction, so it may not be the only focus of interest. Uh, but it's certainly the center of interest. And there, the two worlds are, are of course, connected in that... Um, What's probably what's true in the world of the picture is also true in my game world. Uh, uh, but other things are true in the game world as well. Uh, okay. Right. Yeah, good. It's sort of hard to, to um, put into words. It's not something I've, I've thought of uh, that thoroughly, but um, sort of what I had in mind by broader, broadest world here, um, in a way, certain worlds are um, generated or exist at uh, another world. So you can talk about yeah. the world of um, where there's Cupid. In a way, that's something generated at this, you know, the fictional world of Kofermi or whatever. Um, and because it's sort of generated at that world, it's like less broad in the sense that I'm talking about. That's because, I don't know, maybe it's, it's, yeah. it's because in the world of Vermeer's painting, there's a picture of Cupid that there is in this other world, Cupid, okay? And it's by looking at the picture, Vermeer's picture, that we uh, understand the world in which Cupid exists. Uh, it may not be quite the same if we have a story about, and the story says that, well, someone was playing a harpsichord and uh, in a room and on the wall was a picture of Cupid. Suppose that's written in a story. Uh, in that case, I don't know if we imagine that Cupid exists, but we certainly don't imagine seeing Cupid when we read that story. So it's uh, the relation is a little bit different than in the Vermeer case. Or another example, um, it may be clear, <clears throat> and there are some cases, I'm not remembering exactly one, but where it's, you have a picture of a picture, but you see only the back of the internal picture, but somehow you know 
that the internal picture is really a picture of Cupid, although you don't see that in the, in the external picture, and that may be a bit different. So you're not you're not going to imagine seeing Cupid in that case. You're going to imagine only seeing a picture, which is in fact a picture of Cupid. Uh, and so the difference, uh, so that'll be a different kind of case. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely a room for um, philosophical work here, trying to try and do more, more um, maybe develop some more proposals or some ideas here. Um, I do have another couple of other questions about um, about fiction here. Um, okay. One, yeah, I mean, it's interesting how imagination plays a pivotal role here. And a concern that potentially came to mind was that um, fictions can be quite bizarre. Um, um, yep. and in some cases it might, might be not so clear that we can really imagine <laughs> what's, what's going on in them. So, you know, yep. maybe we can have some fiction that has like higher dimensional aliens or something like that. And yep. maybe we can yep. understand the descriptions to some extent. It's not clear that we're really imagining them. Uh, it's a, it's a yep. significant sense. Is that right? Where, yep. What do you think about, about that? Oh, good, good question. Uh, I don't rule out the possibility of its being fictional in some kind of a logical, uh, bizarre story that P and not P, that, uh, that it, I don't say that it cannot be true ever, that it's fictional, that Cupid exists and does not exist. Uh, and as you say, maybe we cannot imagine that. Maybe that's impossible to imagine. I don't actually... Uh, have an opinion about whether that's possible or not, uh, but it may very well be impossible. But uh, what makes it true in the fiction uh, is that it's to be imagined, not whether it actually is imagined, and not even whether it can be imagined. If you have a, a legal system, uh, uh, it could very well be screwed up and require you to do certain things and require you not to do the very same things in the same circumstances. So we might say that it requires you uh, mandates doing both, both doing and not doing it, even though that you can't, can't do that. Okay. But what makes it uh, uh, required is the mandate and what makes something fictional, even if it's a contradiction or something uh, otherwise crazy, like time, uh, time travel or some sort or whatever, uh, what makes that fictional is that it's to be imagined, even if it's and that's possible, even if it's not possible to actually imagine it. So, yeah, good. Yeah, good. I think, and then, but the this to be imagined has to do with the intents of the author. Is that correct, or how is that construed? Ah, that's that's something I was going to say something about. Um, it's a norm, and some norms, things that are to be done, are grounded in someone's intentions. And I do think that it's certainly possible and probably is true sometimes that uh, the reason why we are to imagine certain things in certain circumstances is because the author wanted us to or intended us to and so forth. But uh, there are lots of norms which are not based on anyone's intention. And uh, uh, the norms of etiquette, for instance, and uh, uh, other kinds of things that are to be done, uh, just because there's in the society an implicit understanding that there certain things are properly done and others are not. So uh, it's also true. I think it's true probably in the uh, case of the uh, people lying in the meadow looking at the clouds in the sky and wondering whether it's a bear or an elephant or a walrus or whatever. Uh, it's probably there. there's a norm there. And in that very uh, local context, uh, maybe it's true that the, the kids are to imagine a walrus and they are not to imagine a bear. Uh, but that's not because of anybody's intention. That's not because anybody set things up in order to uh, 
uh, get people to imagine that. It's just understood in that very local context uh, implicitly. So there's no reason at all that that can't be true in the case of works of art also. And uh, uh, there's, of course, lots of work done on what propositions are and are not fictional in various works of art. And uh, sometimes it seems appropriate to ask what the author intended. Sometimes some things will be true in a fiction which the author didn't intend or didn't foresee, uh, or maybe didn't explicitly. Uh, but it may be that our traditions of understanding certain kinds of work are such that it's actually true that we are to imagine this and not to imagine that. And so something is fictional, but not where they, that those mandates are not grounded uh, on anybody's intentions. And I think this is a tremendously important point. Uh, it also connects with the fact that some fictions are, some fictional worlds are not involved in, and in, uh, are not are not connected with works of art or works of fiction, works of art at all. Uh, children's games is one example, and there are lots of others. But I think it's very good to be able to see the commonality among all of these kinds of cases, and then distinguish cases uh, where the worlds of fiction are not, uh, 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 where, where fictional truths are not grounded in intentions and cases in which they are. Uh, lots of interesting differences then. Okay? Does that help? Yeah. Yeah, it does, for sure. Um, you would say, though, that there's some, there's probably some vagueness, right, in, in what the sort of norms regarding the understanding of fiction are, right? It's not... Indeed, it's not, yeah. Yeah. That. There are lots of cases where it's not, uh, there's really no correct answer about whether a certain proportion is true in a fiction or not. And there will be lots of cases in which it's not clear whether what is fictional is to be grounded in artists' intentions or not. That may be very vague too. But there are the two different kinds of cases um, and some clear ones as well as lots of fuzzy ones. Right. Yeah, like I, I want to say that, um, the you know, did Harry Potter have an even number of 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 hairs? You know, it's like, um, yeah, it's just no fact of the matter there, right? It's just not something. Yeah, well, there actually, uh, one extra clause which I didn't mention is a proposition is fictional if it's uh, to be imagined. Um, uh, should the question arise, and uh, the number of hairs, or maybe a uh, different, ex maybe it's unclear what counts as a hair, so it may be unclear how many there are. But suppose there's a picture of a picket fence, and uh, there are a uh, definite number of pickets. If you count them, they may turn out to be an odd number or an even number. And uh, is it fictional? that there's an even number if when you count them on the picture it turns out to be even. Well, I'd say yes, but not really because viewers are a ma are mandated to imagine it or supposed to imagine it or they're missing anything about anything significant or important about the picture if they don't. But should the question arise, that is, if somebody asks you how many, uh, are there an even or an odd number of pickets in the picket fence, you can count them and come up with an answer that is maybe definitely true. Uh, but that's only because you're mandated, prescribed to imagine that should the question arise. And it doesn't mean that full appreciation will, will require that the question does arise. Yeah, good. That's, that's a, um, that seems like a good clarification there. Um, well, what about the case where, um, so going back to the bizarre fiction example with the, um, I don't know, with this like higher dimensional aliens, um, ah. what if, what if the, the creator of the, the work of fiction isn't really intending us to, to imagine, you know, what those things would be like. And I mean, maybe there's no norms of 
um, understanding fictions according to which we're meant to imagine them. I, I don't know. Um, could that be? And so maybe they're part of the fiction, but it's not that we're imagining them in some way. Uh, well, there are going to be cases in which it might seem that we are to imagine something, but we don't quite know what it is. Uh, we don't know what it would be for aliens to have a multidimensional universe of a certain kind, maybe. And uh, then uh, it may be unclear what we're to say is actually true in the fiction. Uh, it might be that, uh, well, if we have an omniscient narrator and it's understood that what the narrator is to be trusted, that is, whatever the narrator says is understood to be true in the fiction, and the narrator says, um, well, it was both P and not P, and there was a multidimensional alien uh, and so forth. And if we don't know what that if we don't know what that means, then we might say that what's fictional is that something or other by that description is true. Uh, that is true in the fiction, but there may be nothing more specific about what is true in the fiction. So there may there may be a big gap there. That might be the that might be the the only correct thing to say about this case. Yeah. Okay. Uh, fair enough. And then another concern, although I think your what you said a minute ago um, helped to clarify this a little bit. Um, there's other cases where, um, so this. It seems correct to say that in the fiction of Harry Potter, to use, go back to that example, um, Harry Potter has a pancreas, but there's no explicit yeah. statement of this. And it's yeah. not obvious that a full appreciation of the fiction requires us imagining him yeah. as having such. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. How would you characterize that? Um, well, I think I'd pro say that probably that is true in the fiction. Uh, again, should the question arise, and uh, uh, very likely it won't arise, and it maybe shouldn't arise, uh, but if it is true in the fiction, it's of course true because of background knowledge, and background knowledge of course is tremendously important in lots of cases of fiction, and uh, uh, there's what I call the reality principle of, of implication, which suggests that uh, 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 if uh, somebody is a person, uh, if it's fictional that somebody's a person, then it's fictional uh, that uh, that person is has all the characteristics that real people have, unless there's something in the work to uh, 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 change that. And so, probably, I mean, some people will say, uh, I think some. Uh, philosophers may say that, well, it just isn't, because, and partly because it's not important. But I think we do have to make a big difference, make a big separation uh, between fictional truths that are important and ones that are not, and a lot of them which are maybe important, but not clearly important, or somewhat important and not very important. And uh, that would suggest allowing that, well, the pancreas case, yes, it is fictional, but it's tremendously unimportant in uh, that particular fiction. There are other ways of dealing with it as well, though I think that's the one I prefer. Good. Yeah, that that uh, that reality principle stuff. I know um, uh, David Lewis uh, included some of that in his uh, pretense theory. He says something similar there. I think. Yeah, he has he has a uh, he has a very similar notion of reality principle, although it's set up for the. Uh, but I, as you probably know, I also think that the reality principle is very, very limited, and there are lots of exceptions to it, lots of other principles involved uh, in different kinds of cases. Right. So, so really kind of when you're approaching some fiction and you're trying to carefully figure out what's sort of true in that fiction, you want to consider all the, the relevant norms uh, of, of interpretation of, of the fiction and um, yeah, kind of weigh the different the different proposals there for what's true in that fiction. Uh, yeah, kind of there will be 
there will be different uh, uh, traditions and with different genre and different general rules about what can be and what can't be in some fictions. Uh, uh, you just almost couldn't say it's fictional that certain crazy things happen, but in others that's to be expected. And uh, so there, there are um, uh, traditions in different genres and, and that about how you go about deciding what's true in the fiction. And they have to be, of course, taken into account. And they can be very complicated and uh, kind of obscure and fuzzy, of course, in lots of cases. Um, let me just mention one other kind of case. This is the last thing we need to do, I think, on this. Um, that um, I have one photograph of a golfer uh, and they... The, ball, the golf ball, the flying golf ball is shown and it's frozen right in front of his face. And it's almost impossible, I think, not to see that as a picture of him with a golf ball nose. Okay. And uh, I think we can, this may depend on uh, maybe not the original uh, picture photograph in the newspaper, but when someone shows it, they might uh, point this out. And so there may be a situation in which it's to be understood that one is to imagine seeing a person with a golf ball nose. Okay. But nevertheless, that's probably not true in the picture as a whole. Uh, and uh, so it'll be another case in which a pro uh, proposition's uh, man, uh, uh, imagining a proposition is mandated, but is not true in the picture. So that's just another kind of case. So, yeah, this is about maybe all we need to do on this if that's okay uh all right so i did want to uh, move on and talk about um some other things including some of your work on aesthetics and, and art so well, one thing one thing you've noted is that um aesthetics is a field of philosophies um kind of strange and it doesn't really have some grand like basic question um as in some fields like epistemology and ethics um how would you construe the like boundaries of, of aesthetics? Is it just that there's this rough collection of things that we're counting as aesthetic discourse, experience and features and so on without very clear criteria in mind? Or is there much more to, more to go on there? Well, as you say, I, I don't think aesthetics has a, what's been called a grand basic question. And I get that term from Alan Gibbard, who described ethics as as having a grand basic question, namely how how to live, how we should we live our lives, and uh, I guess his thought was that just about everything that counts as ethics is some has some relation to that question. And uh, if you look at uh, aesthetics, uh, the way it has been practiced in the last uh, hundred years or so, fifty years anyway, hundred years, uh, it's not at all clear that there's any one. A uh, question or any one cl uh, collection of closely related questions, uh, which sort of governs the whole thing. Uh, <clears throat> there's, uh, 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 well, uh, aesthetics supposedly came into play, the notion of aesthetics came into play in the 18th century, and uh, we have Kant and Hume and so forth who are concerned with. Hume very explicitly with the question of uh, what what we is proper what properly should we like uh, or enjoy, and uh, that of course is one important question. Uh, more recently, some have thought that uh, Arthur Danto, in particular, has taken aesthetics to be based around the question of what is art. But if we look at what's actually done uh, under the name of aesthetics. Uh, uh, recently, uh, there are lots of things that are done that don't seem to have any particular relation to either of those questions. Uh, uh, you can think of lots of examples, questions about uh, visual perspective. Is it natural, not natural? Uh, questions about what we can learn or can't, or, or, or how we learn from things like novels 
and uh, pictures and so forth. And uh, uh, those two questions, for instance, uh, can certainly be pursued without ever asking whether the objects we're dealing with count as art or not. That needn't be involved at all. There are, of course, other things that do involve the question of what is art uh, or the question of what, are, what should we properly like, but lots of other questions that don't. So um, it seems to me that aesthetics, as it's been practiced recently, is really a hodgepodge, an enormously interesting hodgepodge of things, and there are all kinds of uh, links between various parts of it and so forth, and the parts are very interesting and fascinating and so forth. But it's not clear that it's a, a, a sort of coherent single uh, body of uh, issues that we're dealing with. Uh, that's no reason not to do aesthetics. It's no reason not to think about all those issues. And uh, a lot of them, of course, are issues that are very closely related to other parts of philosophy, but some are, have been kind of not, uh, not emphasized in other parts of philosophy. Uh, I might mention the notion of metaphor, which is tremendously important in the arts and poetry, but also tremendously important outside of the arts. And uh, there are now lots of linguists and philosophers of language who are concerned with it, but that's a relatively recent development. Uh, I think uh, 30, 40 years ago, I'm not sure that anybody much was talking about metaphor uh, and irony and, all, of course, other kinds of figures of speech are uh, tremendously important now, not only in among people who call themselves aestheticians, but of course among philosophers of language and, and ling linguists. But that hasn't always been true. And fiction, actually. Uh, fiction itself is uh, uh, goes far beyond the arts. And I think it's important for anybody interested in fiction to consider not just works of art that are works of fiction, but also lots of other cases where fiction comes into play. Um, and uh, uh, that's something that philosophers of language and metaphysicians should be interested in and are interested now, but they haven't always been. Okay. Yeah, good. That's a, that's a good, it's a good intro here. And then one thing you mentioned there was, um, uh, Arthur Danto. And then that question, what is our, and I, I think you remarked that, uh, in this paper that I read that you're kind of skeptical of this, um, in part, as I understand, because it's not clear that there's a single question being asked here, or it's not clear exactly which question is being asked here because, um, well, people can be using the same term in many different ways. Yeah. Like, uh, generally, uh, yeah. If you want to jump in there. Sure. Well, uh, our, uh, I think his name is Oscar Chris Diller, wrote a very nice historical essay, uh, in which he argued, and I think he's probably right, that the uh, current notion in Western culture of fine art uh, didn't arise until, uh, I think, about 1750. And before that, they had notions of sculpture, notions of poetry, uh, painting, and so forth, but those weren't uh, thought of as belonging to a single a genus, species of a single genus. And uh, 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 of course, people like Arthur Danto and others want to say that, well, uh, lots of, of course, and I think we also want to say that insofar as we're having to use the term art, uh, lots of things uh, the, in the ancients produced and so forth count as art in our sense. But it's not clear that that was an important issue, whether they were art art or not, whether they count as art or not, it, for the Greeks uh, or in anything like the modern sense of art for the Greeks or for other perhaps non-Western cultures. So, uh, and in the Western culture, the notion has, uh, well, I'm sure it's changed quite a lot, but also theories about what art is have certainly changed. Uh, uh, theories about what counts as art, uh, maybe they start with a, attributing somehow to the Greeks 
the notion of mimesis as a definition of uh, in defining art, and then there are formalist definitions, uh, there are definitions in terms of expression, and definitions in terms of communication. There is Danto's own notion of having to do with interpretive qualities that a work has to make it count as art. Uh, there are definitions in terms of beauty. Maybe those are the formalist ones, I don't know. And then, of course, there's Nelson Goodman's very different uh, account of art uh, in terms of the place of an object in a symbol system. Uh, and all these definitions are so different that it really makes you wonder whether people, philosophers, per, per, uh, per, uh, proposing these definitions are really answering the same question or uh, are trying to analyze the same notion or anything of the sort. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's a big confusion. And uh, I guess I think about the notion of art somewhat the way I think about the notion of fiction, of works of fiction, that is, as opposed to works of nonfiction. Uh, it's not clear that that notion has, in general, a very important place in our dealings with the arts. Now, of course, Danto is absolutely right that in the 1960s and 1970s art scene in New York, the question of what is art was absolutely crucial to the activities that people were doing, what they put into museums, how they look at things, how they think about things, and so forth. So uh, a notion of art was certainly central in those activities, but it hasn't been central in lots of other activities that people have engaged in, in connection with other things that we might want to call art. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I guess the. I don't know. This just seems like a general uh, problem, um, in in philosophy and maybe elsewhere that um, when different people are offering these these accounts of say art or knowledge or or freedom or or ethics yeah. or a bunch of other things and they come up with very different accounts you know it could be yeah. that um you know at least most of them are getting it wrong but they're talking about the same thing or at least attempting to talk about the same thing or it could be that they're to some extent talking past each other they're just talking about something else and giving you an account of something else yeah um yeah and I, you know, the, I worry that that's kind of more common than people often think. Maybe it's it's present here too, in in, in art and aesthetics. Um, I don't know. Is that part of your worry there? I mean, pr what what is present here too? You mean that? Well, that people are kind of talking past each other when they're giving. Oh, yeah. Accounts of art, yeah. Just talking about different things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that's true in lots of cases, and we'd have to look at details to decide uh, how it's true, but. Uh, I think one thing that's important to look at uh, if you're considering the history of these things is the relationship between uh, one person's account of or definition of knowledge or art or fiction and previous ones. And uh, sometimes uh, there's a fairly clear relation. Uh, I mean, it's pretty obvious in the case of, of definitions of knowledge for instance, what's wrong with the previous ones? And uh, you point out certain cases which we might thought of all always thought of as instances of knowledge or not instances of knowledge, and uh, try to say why. Uh, so, I mean, Gettier was dealing with, I think, uh, the same uh, notion or something like the same notion that previous definers of the word knowledge were. Uh, but what's uh, kind of striking about art is that uh, a lot of the definitions seem to have nothing much at all to do with the previous ones. They just start again. Uh, and also, of course, in lots of cases, what counts the extension of the term uh, can vary tremendously. Uh, you may remember that uh, Clive Bell and Tolstoy both uh, wanted to uh, restrict the notion of art radically from what it had been uh, and in, in very different directions. And they wanted to rule out certain things 
as being art, uh, but rule out very different things. Um, and so they were had, had obviously different agendas there. And then, of course, there are others, especially in the 1960s and 70s in, in uh, New York and the avant-garde, where just about everything maybe came to be considered art. Uh, so uh, it's... It's, I guess, it's what's interesting is partly how these new notions of art have what they have to do with the previous ones. And sometimes it seems that uh, new definers of the word art or the new or of the word fiction uh, start from scratch and do something entirely different and are maybe dealing with uh, not really disagreeing with the previous um, notions of art but uh, defining a completely new notion and one that may not have been, uh, may or may not have been important in anybody's practices. That will be interesting too. Right, good. Yeah. Um, so then, you know, part, part of, part of understanding um, what these notions and practices is, I mean, it's a sort of empirical psychology, then, right? It's it's you know, yeah, figuring out how people are using the terms, what, um, what they have in mind, so to, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. Um, so, and a lot of it, of course, uh, in, is conceptual analysis. Uh, although I don't think that applies to Tolstoy, and I don't think it applies to Clive Bell, because uh, in what's called conceptual analysis, uh, you look and see what people actually do call art, for instance, and try to say what all those instances, uh, well, first of all, you pretty much assume that what's normally called art is art uh, in the current uh, uh, meaning of the term. And then you try to find out what that meaning is, trying to give maybe necessary and sufficient conditions for something belonging to that class. Uh, and uh, But that's, that's, I don't know if that's what Danto does, but it's certainly not what Tolstoy and Clive Bell did. It may be, it may or may not apply to certain other people, uh, theorists. Right. I and mean, you wouldn't want to, um, you don't think that's the way to go, right? That to provide, try to provide necessary sufficient conditions for, for our, uh... uh, well, I don't, I, that, that's kind of complicated. Um, <clears throat> I think if we're trying to figure out what's the best theory to account for paintings, sculptures, poetry, various kinds of poetry, uh, uh, drawings, uh, scientific work, and so forth, um, we shouldn't assume that the current folk notion, as we'll call it, of art is going to be very helpful in doing that. But on the other hand, uh, if we're interested in understanding what's going on in the 1960s and 70s avant-garde uh, with Duchamp and John Cage and uh, uh, other crazy people like that, uh, we, we have to understand what, I mean, they were playing around with the notion of art. Okay, playing around with what should go in musician, museums and not on the basis of whether they are art or not, and uh, what counts as art. Uh, and so we really do have to understand what notion was current then in order to understand what they're doing and why they are doing, doing it. So we need to, and that may require some conceptual analysis. That may require, well, let's look and see what in 1960s and 70s in New York, uh, the art scene, what counted for them, for people then, uh, or for the artists, either one or both, what counted for them as art and what not, and then see what their various works, uh, the urinal and so forth, have to do with uh, how, how they're connected with that notion of art. Uh, whereas if we're talking about Greek sculpture, or we're talking about uh, uh, Javanese gamelan music. Uh, maybe, maybe there's no point in even thinking about is it art or not. 
in, uh, in anything like our modern sense. Uh, let's look at the music, the Gamelan music. Let's look at the uh, Greek sculptures and see what they do for us, how they're important, how they were important for people in Greece, and so forth and so on. Okay. Right. And then, and then your, I think your earliest book, um, um, Mimesis, uh, which is just a, I take it a word for sort of representation or imitation. Um, yeah. That's sort of central to your, to your theory of, um, your understanding of art. Uh, can you elaborate on, on that? Um, well, um, yeah, it's not, I mean, I, I, I do subtitle that as on the foundations of representational art, I think. As, I can't remember. Is that the, uh, anyway, I do talk about a lot of art in that book, but it's not basically uh, an attempt to give an account of what counts as art or not. As a matter of fact, I think I make explicit, maybe in the introduction, that uh, uh, lots of things that may count as art are not representations in the sense that I develop in that book. And lots of things that are representations in that sense probably don't count as art. Uh, there are representations of, uh, oh, in scientific investigations and in all kinds of other cases. Uh, children's games probably are not art. Uh, children's make-believe games are probably are not art, yet those are a paradigm of what I count as representations um, in my sense. So... Uh, I may not have uh, uh, focused on this enough, but I think that it's really crucial to think of my thoughts in that book not as being an account of what of art uh, in particular. It's an account of what happens in lots of cases, including quite a few cases, but in all cases of what we might call art, what we might call art, certain kinds of art. Okay. Good. Uh, yeah, and then and then you're you had said that uh, you don't want to like necessarily take folk uh, concepts or folk theories or even like refinements of them uh, as part of the theories that we endorse. Um, although in some cases it might be um, makes sense to do so. Um, but like I was wondering, I feel like whether we do that, maybe you're going to agree with this. Is 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 whether we're going to take the sort of folk concepts as part of our theories is going to depend on what our theories are meant to be theories of. So if, if I want to have a theory of quote unquote art, where what, what art is, is just, um, fixed by certain common use of the term, maybe, um, then I'm going to have to use those folk concepts uh, yeah. to understand yeah. that theory. Um, so yeah, I guess, um, does that all seem right, or or, or, is, or am I missing something there? Uh, yes, I think so. <clears throat> um, as you say, we want to think first about what sort of thing things we're trying to understand, and uh, let's say that uh, one uh, bunch of things we want to understand are paintings, paintings of many different kinds, novels, stories and the practices of people in making paintings and looking at paintings in uh, putting them in museums or not in museums and using uh, pictures for uh, scientific purposes, for instance, and in stories of various kinds and uh, music and so forth and so on. A lot of those things are things that we like to understand. And then to understand them, to develop a theory, uh, well, I mean, I'm, of course, not wanting to give an account of what theories are, uh, but I want to. I can say a few things about what I think they are, and I think they typically involve a taxonomy, uh, which is a scheme of deciding among the objects that we're interested in uh, what similarities and differences there are among them in various different respects and what counts as genuses of certain sort and species of a genus, and so on. And uh, then I think that we have folk theories, 
uh, which answer try to answer some of these questions, which gives a taxonomy. And uh, in uh, some folk, recent folk theories, uh, one category is the category of art, and maybe a maybe or maybe not a, a more specific category is that of fine art, as well as that of paintings and so forth. Uh, which, of course, is different from thinking, saying that what you're interested in are particular paintings, particular things that we do call paintings. But then <clears throat> the question is, well, uh, is it useful or helpful to classify them all as painting, all these things as paintings, and other pictures as not paintings? And it may or may not be. And is it useful to classify uh, a lot of these various things we're interested in as works of art or not? And uh, I guess uh, uh, the first thing we can do in trying to develop a uh, viable taxonomy, a helpful taxonomy of these things, is to look at the ordinary taxonomy that comes, uh, that's basically a matter of our uh, folk theories, okay? And we can think of our folk theories uh, as involving uh, what, uh, conceptual and analysts will try to understand uh, what counts as what what uh, ordinary notions concepts apply to what collections of things and so forth. Uh, but that may not be the best way of di of dividing things up. There may be we uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, I think that the notion of art and the notion the current notion of art. There's probably lots of them, but probably take any one of them. And uh, current notions of works of fiction uh, are pretty uh, confusing and not very helpful in understanding the things that they're supposed to apply to. And so it's probably uh, desirable that we uh, 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 fix or change or maybe even replace in a wholesale way the... Uh, uh, folk theory that we're dealing with. Um, but then, as I think I uh, pretty much mentioned, part of what we're interested in <clears throat> is the activities that we engage in in connection with various paintings, various kinds of paintings, and movies, and, and uh, so forth. Uh, the activities are sometimes very much influenced and very much involved the current notion or a current notion of art or a current notion of fiction. And in so that, far as that's true, of course, we want to pay attention to what the current notions are so that we can understand these activities. So, so conceptual analysis then is important in two different ways. One is giving us candidates for a theory uh, to understand uh, what the ordinary notions are part of a theory of, uh, and uh, a candidate which may or may not be uh, very helpful and is subject to revision. And uh, then the, th the ordinary theory, the folk theory then, may be in part an object of our investigation insofar as it's involved in the activities that people deal, uh, engage in, in dealing with movies, shows, paintings, novels, and so forth. Okay? Yeah, it sounds like part, part of what you were suggesting there is, um, you know, okay, we have these folk notions, concepts, and maybe theories, but, you know, maybe we can do better. We can, we can revise these concepts or just engineer new ones. Um, is, is that how you see yeah. much of this is sort of conceptual engineering or, or, or revision or... Um, yeah, right. you know when when I wrote that paper that you're referring to, uh, I wasn't aware of the literature on conceptual engineering. In fact, I think maybe there wasn't much of it at that time. Uh, it, it could also be that I just didn't notice it. But uh, I realize now that what I <clears throat> was arguing for was uh, uh, a kind of conceptual engineering. Uh, which uh, involves, for me, it's a little different from some other people's notions about what con conceptual engineering is supposed to do. Uh, but 
but for me, it involves uh, looking carefully at similarities and differences and uh, devising maybe new unheard of concepts that may be give us more perspic uh, more perspicuous picture of the things that we're interested in. Uh, and also, of course, I, I guess I should um, make uh, point out now that as uh, I think everybody pretty much agrees, uh, theories are theories of certain things and there's data they're meant to explain, but you can have different theories uh, uh, accommodating exactly the same data. Uh, and so once you have a bunch of data in, uh, in hand, then you can still argue about what's the best way of understanding it, what's the best way of organizing it, uh, and that can be a, that'll be a matter of conceptual engineering, uh, where you might want to change your concepts or change your theory, not because, as sometimes happens, of course, not because you learn new new facts, you have new information, uh, you've done experiments and come to certain results, but just because you find a more perspicuous, more elegant more simple, maybe more beautiful way of organizing the data, of uh, devising a taxonomy, and so forth. And uh, uh, a question of the relationship between philosophy and science comes up here. I, I think that the theories that, we're, that philosophers and scientists are dealing with are pretty much the same, uh, but Philosophers, rather than rather than looking for new data, I think specialize on uh, devising a theory once the data is in, and the data, of course, sometimes includes lots of things that are just plain common knowledge that people go to movies, uh, that they laugh and cry at movies, and there are certain kinds of movies maybe that they go to concerts and sometimes get uh, wonderful emotional responses to certain kinds of music, uh, that that happens, and uh, lots and lots of other things that <clears throat> are, uh, that we all know about. Uh, but then a uh, philosopher's job is to uh, devise a way of organizing them, <clears throat> finding similarities and differences among different kinds of cases, so that we can understand all that data that we're all familiar with, <clears throat> Uh, uh, better than than we have. I'm going to have to take some liquid here. We do definitely advocate this in the case of of our thin, like the maybe normal discourse or, or um, everyday concepts, of potentially varied as they might be, are kind of messy. Maybe not the best suited for for our theories of of these phenomena. Um, yeah, they they. I mean. <clears throat> Some concepts, like that of art, includes just a hodgepodge of stuff, and uh, maybe sometime, uh, uh, maybe Arthur Danto thinks that there's a single commonality to all of them, but lots of people don't, and uh, so that might mean that the current or a current concept of art is not the best one for understanding all these things. Maybe they... Uh, are lots of different kinds of things. They may be other large concepts. Uh, uh, the notion of make-believe, is, a, as I understand it, is a very large one, and it covers a lot of works of art uh, and lots of other things as well. And I guess I think that's a more useful, uh, more fruitful concept to use in understanding uh, all the various things that we're interested in. So... Uh, so I think of philosophy as primarily a matter of, of uh, 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 theory construction, uh, where uh, the construction that philosophers specialize in is what is done after the data is in. And of course, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of the data is uh, right in front of our eyes, things that everybody knows. Sometimes we, of course, make mistakes, but... Uh, it can also include the results of scientific investigation. But uh, uh, this uh, gives us a way of understanding philosophy as an a priori discipline, uh, even though it's very closely related to science. And it's concerned 
with uh, empirical theories. It's just that collecting the data is, is of course, an empirical invest uh, kind of thing that scientists need to do. Uh, uh, but once the, th once the data is in, you can sit in your armchair and decide, uh, try to figure out what's the best way of organizing it, what concepts are most useful in explaining all this data and so forth. And that is pretty much an a priori uh, kind of thing you can do uh, mostly in an armchair. I'm potentially worried that, um, you know, in our, in our theories of these things, we'll just end up dispensing with this talk of quote unquote art altogether. Maybe that's not even really that helpful at all. Um, we might just talk about various paintings and, uh, whatever social functions they serve and, um, yeah. have the experiences they engender and so on. Um, but they don't have to, we don't need some broad category of, of art that we group these various things under. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Is that a real well, concern to you? Or? Well, as I say, insofar as the concept of art uh, uh, is involved in people's activities, we certainly do have to think of the concept of art. But otherwise, I mean, it probably in uh, uh, ancient times, uh, probably in some other cultures, people got along perfectly well thinking about uh, maybe not novels because they're fairly recent, but uh, stories and storytelling and pictures and so forth without thinking of them in terms of whether they count as art in anything like the modern sense or not. And uh, it may be that to some extent, going uh, back to something like that would be the most perspicuous and elegant way of understanding things. Um, so yes, I I, cer I certainly think that I'm in favor of not using the word art so much. I have used it a lot actually in this talk, but uh, I think that in the long run, when we're uh, not talking about philosophy but trying to do philosophical work on uh, various human activities and so forth, if we use the word art a little less, that might be an advantage. Right. Um, like, that might sound a bit strange if, if you're for someone working in the philosophy of aesthetics, but uh, um, yeah, that's where it goes. Well, yeah. Well, <clears throat> I don't have um, the field of aesthetics is a, uh, a combination of a lot of different things. I don't really mind that, and I especially think it's important to do an awful lot of the kinds of work that philosophical aesthetician, aestheticians do. And uh, so I would certainly, I mean, if you think of aesthetics as a philosophy of art, and some people do, uh, then uh, you, you might think that, well, the field should be, should go out of existence if the word art is so confused. And uh, I don't think that at all. I think that we've got to have a place where all of this kinds of things, some of them pretty just, lots of them connected with loss of language, loss of mind, value theory, ethics, and so forth. But a lot of them also different from uh, what's typically done in those other areas. And we've got to have a way to do the, uh, to do work on all these issues. And uh, if they get included in a grab bag field called uh, philosophy art or aesthetics, fine. Uh, that's one way of getting them involved. That, of course, means of, uh, that, and I'm sure that lots of people agree with this, that is really important for people who call themselves aestheticians and people who call themselves ethicists or philosophers of language to talk with each other, uh, to uh, connect with each other, to trade ideas about uh, things and overlapping things in their two areas and so forth. And uh, I'm not going to worry too much that the issues aestheticians deal with uh, are a grab bag. Uh, it's just that lots of them are very, very interesting and important. And let's, let's get on working on them. Yeah, I think I, I like that outlook. And, and, and I know you've, um, aesthetics is normally, uh, <laughs> 
included under value, a broader under umbrella of value theory. And I, I don't think you've yeah. um, questioned that. Um, maybe it's a really should be considered a separate sort of uh, a domain. Um, do you think that, uh, I mean, maybe well, you could expand on that? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, in the grab bag of issues that institutions talk about are included a lot of issues having to do with value, uh, trying to understand what uh, aesthetic value is, or if there is such a thing, as well as, well, what's valuable about Guernica, Picasso's Guernica, for instance, or what's valuable about Haydn's music. Um, and there are lots and lots of value issues that come up, and they are important. Uh, but there also are lots and lots of issues that as the aestheticians deal with don't have which don't have much to do with questions of value. Um, there's questions of uh, why does well how, do, how why does Haydn's music sound so coherent even though it jumps around in lots of different ways? Well, maybe that has something to do with value. I guess it does have something to do with value. Uh, but there are also questions about how how do metaphors work, uh, which may or may not eventually connect with questions of value, but you can certainly talk a lot about that without ever raising, before you start to maybe raise the question of what is the value of metaphors. So uh, so I think it's misleading to think of aesthetics as is the, the uh, collection of issues that are now count as aesthetics and academic uh, systems uh, as all of them a subfield of value theory. Uh, parts of it certainly are, but are th also parts of it certainly are not. Uh, is there such a thing as not natural perspective or is perspective uh, used in uh, painting for instance, or other kinds of pictures are merely conventional, uh, what kinds of symbol systems are involved and so forth. Uh, all of these can and often are dealt with without raising questions either about whether the, the I, objects are art uh, or about what their value is. Uh, yeah. Good. Yeah. So, so another, another, I did want to talk briefly about a couple other things that you've written on. Um, and one thing that you covered uh, was was empathy um, and, and how we think about that, which is an interesting topic. That was this was from um, uh, a section of your book or a chapter of that book, uh, "In Other Shoes: Music, Metaphor, Empathy, and Existence." And um, as I understand it, very roughly, your account is saying something like empathy involves, you know, having a sort of experience and. Um, under understanding that someone else is having experience relevantly like that or, 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 or this experience, you know, using that experience as a sample. Um, I mean, there's more to it than that, but is that, is that the basic idea or maybe you could expand on, on the account? Yeah. Um, so this is a case in which I'm, su I'm suggesting that we define the term empathy differently from how it usually has been. Uh, although, I mean, the words don't matter that much. We can think of the other accounts of empathy as being uh, uh, accounts of a species of what I call empathy. But uh, uh, typically discussions of empathy uh, think of it as an imaginative uh, experience or process where you do something like imagining yourself in somebody else's shoes or uh, you imagine being them, maybe if that makes sense, or imagine being like them. Uh, uh, perspective taking, taking their perspective, and so forth. And um, I'm interested in a broader notion, uh, which can but doesn't necessarily involve empathy at all. And uh, um, but sorry, which which doesn't necessarily involve imagination at all, although it often does. And uh, that involves what's often called a uh, phenomenal concept. Uh, uh, the notion of phenomenal concepts was developed for completely different purposes, having to do with the mind-body problem. Uh, but it's basically, the idea is this. When you're empathizing with someone, uh, 
uh, when, for instance, someone else is uh, exploring a cave, and you, maybe you imagine exploring the cave also, uh, and uh, you have certain feelings or experiences as you do so, uh, one thing that you might do is if you feel a, a sense of panic uh, or you're upset, you might say to yourself, uh, I feel panic or I feel upset using those words. And then you might attribute that notion, uh, that uh, property to the other person. Well, she probably does feel panic or feel uh, upset or whatever as she's crawling around in a cage, uh, in a cave, for instance. But also, probably you will also be able to say something like this to yourself. Uh, she feels like this, where this is a demonstrative that I use to refer to my own or some aspect of my own state of mind. Uh, so instead of just saying she feels panic or she feels upset, I say she feels like this, and uh, uh, that means that I'm using my own state, my own uh, state, as a sample of a property I'm attributing to her. It may be a property that I uh, include at least properties that I can that I can put in a verbal form. It may be the property including being upset uh, or anxious or whatever, but it's probably also much more specific than that. It's probably what I feel, which I attribute to her, is uh, probably a specific kind, a fairly specific kind of upsetness or uh, an anxiety or whatever. And uh, But I'm using my state then as though my state is a predicate uh, specifying for me a certain property or constellation of properties which I'm actually experiencing, and then I use that to attribute to somebody else. And this gives me, I think if I just, if I'm just able to say the other person feels anxious, even if that's a result of imagining myself in her shoes, that won't count as empathy. That's not enough. There's a more intimate relation between me and the other person than that if we want to count as empathy. And I think that's a matter of my being able to say to myself, well, she feels like this. And so I can say, I really have an intimate notion of what she feels uh, because I'm, a, uh, I'm attributing to her a property which I recognize uh, as the property of, to myself of feeling like this. Uh, and that's using a, what's called a, uh, a phenomenal concept. There's a concept of the property which is phenomenal rather than just the verbally, uh, uh, a verbally uh, described uh, concept or property. So does that, does that help? Yeah, definitely. I actually, um, I, I like that way of, um, of, of thinking about it. Um, um, what do you think about the potential, um, this sort of uh, approach, which is kind of building on this, maybe to say that maybe we can have, um, I haven't thought of really the best way to put this, but like empathy by negation. So you might think that um, what that person is feeling is um, they're lacking this. So I'm, maybe I'm, maybe I'm feeling comfortable or something. And they say like, um, well, I can sort of, you know, empathize with them by saying that they're, they're lacking this <laughs> or something like that, or they're not having this. Um, does that, would that count as empathy or maybe that, I mean, cause it's not, yeah. You see where I'm going there? Yeah. Uh, well, it probably should count as empathy. Uh, I think I might, uh, be able to say myself in certain circumstances, uh, she doesn't feel like this. Um, uh, and that is to attribute a property to her based on what I'm feeling although it's a negative property, it's not feeling like this. For, I mean, for instance, I might think that, although I might be scared silly about crawling around on my hands and knees in a cave and so forth, I might know that she's uh, an accomplished caver, spelunker, and uh, 
this is old hat for her and she's been there many times. And so while I'm quivering uh, myself thinking about what she's doing, uh, I still might, uh, I'm, I might have this experience uh, and I might be able to say to myself, not, uh, it's a good sample. My experience is a good sample of what she's feeling, but it's a good sample of what she's not feeling. Uh, and that, yeah, I think that we might very well count that as empathy. <clears throat> and as again, it, it goes far beyond just saying that, well, she doesn't feel anxious, which I might learn and discover to be true in one way or another. And I might have reason to think that that's true, but that knowing that myself will not be enough for empathy. Okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, interesting idea. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So I guess the more general account then is sort of thinking that, you know, you're demonstrate, you have some demonstrative way of thinking about some experience you have. And in some way you're, you're understanding the other person's experience in terms of that, but it doesn't have to be that yeah. it's like the same sort of experience. Maybe it's that it's patient or yeah. maybe it's more intense or, you know, some other relation to it like that. Yeah. We, yeah, we, we might modify it. We might say she has, she feels like this, but more intensely. And we might have good reason to think that that's true. And uh, that would at least be in part a case of empathy. Um, and I guess I would want to emphasize that although imagining may be a means by which I acquire an experience and also have reason to think that it's a good sample of the other person. There are other cases. It doesn't have to be that. I mean, I might have an. I'm actually not rather than imagining experience. I might have it myself. I might also feel grief, and uh, I might say for maybe the same thing someone else is feeling grief for, or not, or something different. But then I might be able to say to myself, she feels like this, or maybe she doesn't feel like this. Where this again refers to my own mental state, an aspect of my own mental state, even though uh, imagining may not have been involved at all. Uh, but that certainly for me would count as a case of empathy. Yeah, very good. I, I like that way of uh, thinking about it. Um, yeah, so just as, as one uh, kind of final question, I do like to end with a uh, kind of metaphilosophical question. Um, okay. And that is, yeah, well, what do you think is the... Um, value of philosophy i mean why why do you i guess why do you find philosophy worth doing um oh my gosh i think it's important to yeah. i know it's a very broad question but i know what do you think yeah well i guess primarily i think it's lots of fun um and that may sound trivial but it's a very i think profound kind of fun uh coming to understand things. I think there are aesthetic values. If there are any such things as aesthetic values, there are lots of aesthetic values in philosophy and in the kind of various construction that philosophers, uh, I think, do. Coming to see a new and especially perspicuous way of understanding things that seemed like just a jumble or an incoherent batch of stuff before. I thought that can be fun in the way that listening to music can be fun and fulfilling and so forth. Uh, people a asking these questions will often ask, uh, this may be true of students who want to major in philosophy because it's so much fun and they're asking uh, other people ask, well, what can you do with it? Uh, how can you make a living? And that connects with questions about what practical value does it have? And I think it does have a lot of practical value. I think that uh, uh, understanding things, understanding lots of things in better ways and thinking clearly about them uh, can help. I mean, it's, it helps lawyers, for instance. It helps politicians. It helps people dealing with their uh, own personal lives and so forth. So uh, I think that doing philosophy hones our skills in lots of important ways. But I guess I think also, and I don't think this is trivial, trivial whatever at all, uh, it's just a, a profound kind of deep uh, enjoyment or fun in understanding things. And uh, if music and movies and stories and so forth have value, 
then certainly philosophy has value, uh, have a somewhat the same sort. So I guess that's what I would say. Very good. I like, um, I definitely agree with that. Um, so yeah, so I'll end, end the questions there. And uh, uh, thanks again so much for being here. Um, Professor Walton, taking my questions and providing your very thoughtful responses. It's been, uh, it's been great having you. Thank you also, and it, it has been fun. Thank you.